Uh, it's terrific to be with you again today, two weeks in a row. Uh, that's, uh, is that a record? It's getting pretty close anyway. Anyway, but it's great to be here. Um, just a couple of things that before we start our message, and I know that Anthony has already prayed for Dwayne, but today is a day when I think we need to have special prayer for Dwayne. You know, it's always hard losing your mum. And, you know, at this time, it's uh, sometimes you just sort of need to have that special prayer and the support of the church. You know, uh, death is a terrible thing, isn't it? But yet we still have the promises that God has given us. That gives us hope because we know that Jesus has given us life and life eternal. (laughs) But regardless, it's still a, a difficult time. So I'm just going to ask our elders to come up. Um, so just a few of our elders, or all of them. Don't be shy. And thanks, Reuben. And uh, see, Reuben's not shy, is he? That's good, isn't he? Louis. Come on, Tony. Yeah, good on you, mate. And I, I don't know if, uh, I assume Dwayne's not watching, but if he is, um, uh, we, we, we're just glad you can join us, Dwayne, and we just want you to know that our hearts are with you and your family. And um, I'm going to ask a, a couple of the elders to uh, pray with us, um, and uh, I'll, I'll close in prayer. And uh, Theo and... Uh, Louis, would you like to pray as as well? And I'll I'll, I'll close. Heavenly Father, Lord, we'd like to uh, bring Dwayne before you today and and, uh, all of Dwayne's family. I don't know how many of them there are, but uh, we just pray that uh, you'll surround them with your angels, with your loving arms. Um... Comfort them and protect them. Help them to, uh, to not only grieve but to enjoy the family time together. So often it's, it's one of those occasions where everyone gets to see everyone at a funeral. But uh, apart from the sadness that they'll experience, please help them to enjoy the fellowship together. And again, just surround them with your arms. I ask in Jesus' name. Uh, thank you, Father, for this morning. To We're going to pray for Dwayne and his family, be with them and bless them. And um, it is a hard thing to accept when the death gets close to us. And uh, I remember my experience with my mum. It was really a very hard thing to let her go. But be with them and bless the family. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Father in heaven, our Lord, words are difficult at times like this when you lose a loved one. And Lord, we know that when you were here on earth, that when you lost your good friend Lazarus, you wept. And Lord, we find that remarkable given that you knew what was going to happen. You're going to raise them from the dead. You come to give life and life eternal, but yet you still wept. Today, you're weeping with Dwayne and the family and with the passing of Rita. Our Lord, we just ask that your arms will be close to them with the family. Uphold them right now. Uphold them with your promises, knowing that This is not an end, but rather the next moment that Rita will know is you coming again and raising everyone up. And that's terrific news. May those thoughts and promises uphold in your spirit be close to them now. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just one other housekeeping matter. 
um, before we rip into it. Uh, at our last board meeting, the um, board has recommended to the church that we appoint Tony Voss as our new head elder. And uh, so, in accordance with church procedure, we table it for a week and, and then we'll finally vote it through. And um, so, the, the church board has recommended that Tony be our next head elder. And I would just like to thank Tony for uh, accepting uh, this role and uh, appreciate that very much. And uh, we'll just uh, formally vote that through next week after the, the tabling of, of it. All right, so as you are aware, we continue our series, Is Jesus Really Serious About? And today we're going to be looking at, is Jesus really serious about conquering Babylon? And so we're just going to unpack that and uh, there will be some familiar themes in this to you as Seventh-day Adventists. But I just ask that as we sort of go over this, we'll try and take a few different angles with it. But I just ask that you just keep your ears and your hearts open because there's a very good reason why we need to do that, living in our day and age. But before we look at it, you might remember these two characters. Help me out. One of them was the one on the right. Saddam, that's the easy one. Does anyone remember the bloke on the left? Storming Norman, as he was affectionately known, General Norman Schwarzkopf. And he was famous for leading the US forces during the first Gulf War in 91. And of course, there's uh, Saddam Hussein and his uh, very um, typical pose that he had as he uh, led uh, Iraq and uh, he ruled it with a, an iron fist. He was a, a terrible leader. He gassed his own people. He'd committed some uh, shocking atrocities. Uh, but for what we might consider a strange reason, he decided to invade Kuwait. Uh, the eight years of the Iraq-Iran um, war had taken a toll on the country financially. And so Saddam Hussein needed some money. What better way to do that? than to invade your neighbour, Kuwait, which was very rich, very wealthy, and he made the mistake of thinking that America and the other nations would do nothing about it, how wrong he was. And uh, the US, along with George H. Bush, assembled a coalition together of something like 750,000 troops. That's a lot of people to park in or near Iraq, isn't it? To get them all over there. And that's a lot of logistics of food, water, and no doubt a portable McDonald's for the Yanks, and all of that sort of stuff to bring there. It's a logistical nightmare, isn't it? But anyway, uh, 550,000 of those troops were American, so America certainly contributed a lot. And the, the Iraqis had over a million troops. A lot of people, isn't it? You know, for a war. That's a huge numbers. And uh, in a war when you are not on your home turf, they say in the military manuals you need a ratio of three to one in your favour. <coughs> I'm not a military analyst or that, but I'll take their word for it, if you want to win. And so people felt, because the, Yanks, the Americans only had 750,000 versus one million, that, you know, they had a, a battle on their hands. The Iraqis had uh, 4,700 tanks and the Americans only... Uh, 3,500, but George H. 
wanted to rally the troops and that he did and he had the support and uh, the war was certainly on and uh, as, as they amassed but Saddam Hussein stuck to the line he believed that he could beat the Americans and the Kuwaitis were waiting with bated breath for liberation on February 24, 4 a.m., they, oh, well, just 38 days before that, they actually did the uh, air attacks and so they wanted to soften everything up, you know, for the 38 days, taking out their uh, air defences, their air force and uh, uh, their, their columns and that sort of thing. And so, and it wasn't until uh, February 24, 4 a.m., they actually started the ground assault and uh, they then went right through the Iraqi forces and then they took a hook turn around and surrounded them and in four days they were pretty much in Baghdad near the Iraqi airport and they call this the, um, or with the Ukraine war, they call this a thunder run. They just go whoom, straight through and just quickly overwhelm and that's effectively what they did. And I remember at the time, uh, Tarek Aziz, who was the, the foreign minister, who was still trying to rally the Iraqis, was standing by the airport. No, we're in full control of Baghdad. We're in full control of the, the airport. There's nothing to see here while there are explosions going on in the background. And he was ducking like this. And <laughs> it was all, all a farce, really. And it was a bit of a joke and uh, but by that time but uh, uh, this was the retreat from Kuwait and uh, the the Iraqis just surrendered on mass uh, in, in the war and then uh, the Lieutenant General of the Iraqi army on behalf of Saddam Hussein uh, surrendered and Saddam Hussein kept his job as president of Iraq because they didn't want um, Iraq to uh, be totally weak because it needed to be a counterbalance to the force of Iran. And so uh, General Sultan Hussam Ahmed signed the paperwork there. He was number 37 on the cards that the Americans had. You remember on the Second Gulf War, they had all these cards. Well, he, he was number 37 on their list. And uh, he was eventually, he surrendered. He was uh, then sentenced to death, uh, which was uh, commuted to life by um, Prime Minister Jalal Babi, I think his name was. Anyway, he was eventually, he died in prison. And uh, uh, it was all a bit of a, you know, Saddam Hussein who, wanted greatness for Iraq. He looked at the city of Babylon and he wanted, <clears throat> he wanted Iraq to be great. He had delusions of grandeur. But General Norman Schwarzkopf became a, quite a darling of the media. And uh, as I said before, he was affectionately known as Storming Norman. And uh, he, who overwhelmed the Iraqi forces. How did he do that? And it's how he did that is pertinent for us today. And uh, how he did it was that, just to use an illustration, when it comes to lineal thinking, we just go through a process of A plus B plus C equals D. And for us, most of us here are lineal thinkers. And we come to a solution. But today, we live in a complex world. And in a complex world, it's like a scrambled egg. You figure that out? We would much rather have lineal thinking, wouldn't we? It's a lot easier to do. But uh, lineal thinking doesn't kind of exist today because we live in a... That's a complicated world. This is a complex world and a complex world has a whole lot of things going around and so then our brains become like that scrambled eggs or at least mine anyway and uh, but what 
the point here is that General Norman Schwarzkopf took a complex organisation, the multinational force that had gathered under the, under the um, banner of the operation of Desert Storm, and he what? <coughs> Blocked out what? Competing voices and made them work effectively. So what? General Norman Schwarzkopf had, he had a laser-like focus. He got rid of all these other voices all around and in this operation he had a laser-like focus on the defeat of the Iraqis. We need a laser-like focus on maintaining our focus on Jesus Christ, on our relationship with Jesus Christ, because there are many competing voices around that are pulling us in a squillion different directions. We need a laser-like focus. General Stanley McChrystal, who led the second Iraq war, you might recall, was pretty easy in the first part. And then George W. stood there famously on the aircraft carrier and saying, we won the war. If only it was that simple. And, you know, he, he General Stanley McChrystal ended up in a quagmire in Baghdad fighting a guerrilla war. First Gulf War was called a flip phone war. The second one was called a smartphone war. And uh, what happened was that it became all of a sudden, you know, like that other slide with all these different things, the smartphone war, with all so much going on, the enemy was very agile, adaptable, and they were able to bog down the Americans, and the Americans were unable to adapt. We are living in a different world today to what I was raised up as a Seventh-day Adventist. But it still remains the same that we need a laser-like focus that maintains our relationship with God and there are a squillion more different voices that are competing with us that are chipping away and eroding at our relationship with God. And so what God often ends up with is, is leftovers because we're so busy, we're so tired and we're <coughs> unable to, to keep up with all that is going on. And so when we are, we're going to be taking a, a tour through Revelation chapter 14 and we're going to be looking at a city that was 50 k south of Baghdad and it was in, in Babylon there. You might recall that this is the, the original Tower of Babylon uh, that was erected in Genesis chapter... Does anyone know which chapter? About chapter 11. In chapter 11 it talks about the Tower of Babel uh, that, that, that was erected that they wanted to build it up toward... Where? They wanted to build it up toward heaven. You ever wonder what happened to that tower? A bit of curiosity with that. This is, this is um, interesting. There was a, a steel uh, that was found, and uh, this is the, what is called the Tower of Babel steel. Uh, S-T-E-L-E. -E. All right. So, steely or steel is basically an artefact. All right. This was found dating back to the time of, of Babylon, of Nebuchadnezzar's age. And so this is called the Tower of, of, um, of Babel steel. Now, it was discovered in 1917 by three archaeologists, and I can't find a picture of them with it together, you'll notice that there's a big crack that goes through the middle of it. Because World War I was on, they came up with this great idea of, <clears throat> and uh, 
least break it up into three pieces and go to three different parts of the world so we can preserve it. I'm not sure if that was the brightest idea because what happened was that after World War I, they thought, well, let's bring the pieces back together. Guess what? We've only got two now. What happened to the other one? Well, it's lost somewhere in the basement in one of the uh, archaeological museums, so they've lost a piece of this uh, steel. And, and um, so, which is very unfortunate, but it stands about 50 centimetres or almost two feet, uh, two feet tall. And uh, it depicts the, um, this uh, place here, which is believed to be the ruins of the Tower of Babel. And uh, the Tower of Babel was essentially looked like a, a ziggurat, uh, not a cigarette, a ziggurat, and uh, which was used quite widely. And there were a whole lot of these ziggurats at, in the time that were built in Iraq, Iran, and also in Mexico as well. The ziggurats were built there. And uh, they essentially had a, a walkway that would, or some of them had a walkway where you could go up to the top. The idea of these ziggurats was that you would get closer to heaven. And the problem was that they thought that the building was too tall and uh, God was, um, uh, you know, was wanting to come down. They had this idea that God was um, very much human and they brought God down to their own level. But this is the ziggurat and this is the one in, in Iran here. Now, this tongue here is quite literally means a tongue tower. Now, you might recall back in Genesis 11, what happened to the tongues? Tongue, language, language was what? It was confused. And so on that steel, this, it has a reference to, it's called Bushiba, and it literally means tongue power. Isn't that interesting? And so what they are saying that there, this is the part of the tongue tower from the Tower of Babel. And, um, and you, you can see that Nebuchadnezzar actually had two of these, one in the centre of Babylon and one just outside. And um, uh, they, they, these were regarded as the foundation of heaven and earth and Babylon literally means what? Gate of God. So you can see how this had become very much a, a symbol in opposition to God. And on the steel that I was referring to that was broken in three, it, say, uh, it says here, I am Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. My great Lord has established me in strength and has urged me to repair his buildings, the Tower of Babylon, I have made and finished. The Tower of Bushiba, which had been built by what? A former king. He had completed 42 cubits, but he did not finish its head from the lapse of time, become ruined, rained and wet, and, um, and then it just goes on. So the point here was that this tower had been built by previous uh, a, a king. Now, the Tower of Babel, what some archaeologists are saying, rather than being totally destroyed, leveled, but actually the ruins remain there. Nebuchadnezzar tried to rebuild it, Xerxes tried to do something with it, and then Alexander the Great tried to rebuild it as well. But what happened to Alexander the Great? Well, he died when he was about 31 or 33, so he never got a chance to do anything. So, in the development of the city, 
The Babylonian gods, the development of the city was envisioned a vision God in human terms and it brought God down to fallen humanity and it fashioned, this is the important point here, it fashioned um, gods in their own image. What does that mean? Yes, you're bringing God down, but you're fashioning God in our own image. That's like what I said to you last week. Sometimes we do a cardboard cutout of who God is and what he is like. We cut him down to what fits us. God should do this. I think that God should have done that. I think God should blah, blah, blah. I am entitled because I have done da, 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 da. This is not fair. I have done this, 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 this and this. And so we give God a resume of all the things that we have done. And the consequence of the Babylonians when they served their gods, there was no uh, moral principles. And, and their gods become, the more the gods become like people, the easier it is for what? To believe in them. And that's a danger we have when we have a cardboard cutout of God. He becomes like us and then it becomes easier to believe and to follow because we have reduced God down to the size that fits, best fits my lifestyle, my needs, my wants. Now, I want us to take a squiz at Revelation 14. Let's uh, go to Revelation 14. We go to Revelation 14, and I think that we'll be looking at verse 8. All right. Yeah. Uh, so we're looking at the second angel's message. We won't look at the first because um, I don't think we'll get time. All right, so another angel, a second follows, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual morality. And then in verse 9 it says that another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives the mark on its forehead, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger and he'll be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And uh, so what, what we see in Revelation 14 is a positive side to that of Revelation 13, which was a, quite a negative picture of what the beast has looked like. And so just to help us to... Uh, um, Draw, draw that kind of contrast. In Revelation 13, you have a, a picture of, of the beast and then you p compare and contrast that with that of the lamb, who is gentle. And, and, um, and then on the other side, you've got the mark of the beast versus the mark of God, false worship versus true worship, and the beast, idolaters, damnation. And in Revelation 14, you also have the picture of eternal life. And those who follow the beast and those who follow the lamb. In the first part of Revelation 14, it talks about that. And then you've got the beast and, uh, of 666. And then you've also got the, the number of the redeemed, which was how many? 124,000, was it? 144,000. And so you've got the number of the redeemed there. And so we obviously don't take that number as literal. Um, but you, you, so you've got the picture 
um, of a positive side in Revelation 14, even though it is talking about Babylon and, and its destruction. And uh, so essentially what we are looking at here is, in Babylon is, is false worship. And false worship, even though we may look at Babylon as a false worship over in a certain part of the world in, in, in Italy and false religion and false organisations. That's true. That's very true. But as well as, there's more to it than just that. Now, the reason when we look at Rome and, and false Christianity and false religions, we put it over there. And we feel that because we are Seventh-day Adventists over here and we know that over there, we have that here, we are okay. Having that knowledge helps but you're not necessarily okay because Babylon itself represented false worship, false ideas. In this day and age, with all the competing voices, as I said before, we have that tendency to cut God down to our size. We have all these artificial lights around us that make us feel good and comfortable. But we don't realise that sometimes those artificial lights tend to obscure, dim God's light that is shining on. And so the more the gods become like people, the easier it is for them to believe. It's easy to believe in a God when we sort of cut it down to our size, isn't it? Much easier. I believe, people will say, much easier to do that. Now, so, this is where things sort of become a, a little bit awkward. I know we, you know, when we come to talking about Babylon, Revelation, we sit there and our eyes roll around the head. And the eyes roll around the head and say, well, I've heard this before. I've heard it for decades and I'm tired of it and I'm sick of it. And unfortunately, that is true for a lot of Adventists. When we look at the first, second and third angel's message, we say to, some say to themselves, I've heard this before and I've had enough. But, let me share something with you that I think is, is mind-blowing and surprising. And this is apart from this talking about this religion over here. I, I don't want to go on about the religion in Rome or false Christianity. I don't want to go on about that. Where I'm heading is us and God. All right, us and God. All right, so let me share with you from a message from one of our pioneers. We do not half take it in. My heart trembles in me when I think of a foe we have to meet. This is talking about us and how poorly we are prepared to meet him. The trials of the children of Israel and their attitude just before the first coming of Christ have been presented before me again and again to illustrate the position of the people of God and their experience just before their second coming. How the enemy sought every occasion to take control of the minds of the Jews. Today he is seeking to blind the minds of God's servants. Now you will recall that the Jews were good Adventists, theoretically, in the, in the belief of the coming of the Messiah. 
But there was something wrong with their, the operative word in this um, quote here is attitude. Attitude. Uh, and that they were poorly prepared uh, in, in meeting of the Messiah. And their attitude just before the first um, coming of Christ would be present again at the second coming. So what is this attitude? Hmm. Let me share with you this one here. Also from one of our pioneers, there is a striking similarity between the Church of Rome and the Jewish Church at the time of Christ's first advent. While the Jews secretly trampled upon every principle of the law of God, they were outwardly rigorous in the observance of the precepts, loading it down with exactions and traditions that made obedience painful and burdensome. All right, so there's a striking similarity between what? The Church of Rome and the Jewish Church. What did we read before? The attitude of the Jews and us. How could that be? Oh, hold on. We're looking at false religion over here. Isn't that just over here? Oh, hang on. There is the attitude that was present with the Jews would be present with those who are waiting the second coming. The attitude that was the same with Rome is the same with the Jews. Do you find that surprising? Not, not with me. Not with me. That's easy to say, isn't it? I am okay. What is this attitude? Let me say this. That our biggest challenge is, you remember with lineal leadership, uh, lineal decision making, it's ch -ch 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 like this. Then in a, in a complex world, there's a whole lot of things going around. Today we have a whole lot of voices that are swirling around us that are eroding our confidence in God. And this is why we need, just like Norman Storman, a laser-like focus. Our biggest challenge is that we are self-sufficient. I am okay. I am independent. I can survive. I can do this. I can do this by myself. I have done this, 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 and this, and this. The issue with Rome was that they had a system of works and rituals that would absolve and that would help them to gain heaven or, and or reducing time in purgatory or whatever. We have a similar kind of thinking. We value our independence. The Western world loves being independent and doing it my way. To be humble and subservient and to follow God, to be a follower of him and to cooperate with him and to do his will each and every day without cutting it down to the size that best fits Mark's personal needs and agenda is very difficult. Do you understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? The most difficult thing for us to do is to walk with God with a laser light focus to be doing his will without cutting God down to the size that best fits my own personal needs and agenda. That's hard because I want to do it my way. I want to do it how I want. I will give God this much, not that much. I'll give what I think is 
necessary. That same sort of works and idea is very much present as it was in the first century. The Jews were um, believed in salvation by works. Many Adventists also believe that they will be saved by their works. I have done this, 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 and this, and this. And the basis of every false religion is that there is a class of worshippers who follow the example of Cain includes by far the greater portion of the world for nearly every false religion has been based on the same principle that man can depend on his own efforts for salvation. It is claimed by some that the human race is in need not of redemption but of development that can refine, elevate and regenerate itself. That every false religion has been based on the same principle that is based on my own works, that I can depend on my own efforts for salvation. And that undermines grace. We are saved by grace. But we have to learn to live under grace. We're not saved by works. God is not opposed to effort in the sense of it takes effort to maintain that relationship and it takes effort to have focus on God. But he is opposed to the attitude that my works will save me as it was in the first century. And that same attitude that was back then is also in Rome because that was a system of works too that bypassed grace. God has given us a message that redresses that. And that's why it's so great to be a Seventh-day Adventist because we have the message, we have the best understanding of grace, we have the best understanding of Daniel and Revelation and what's going to happen at, at the end. Now, and, and Babylon represents the false worship and that false worship is one that seeks to do it my way, brings God down to my level and that's that cardboard cutout. And, um, and so uh, and we, we need to do everything that we can to guard against that. Now, when I first came into the church and I was told about Revelation 13, I thought the church was nuts. Sorry. And, and to even think that we would be entering a time when people would lose the ability to have the freedom of worship and the mark of the beast would come in, I thought, this is nuts. How could that be? Because back then, it was live and let live, and things were pretty good. Pretty good. But there has been a remarkable change in our world. In the three angels' message, God says, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. He says that twice. And if Babylon is about false religion, then God is moving things toward a conclusion. That would be fair enough. Back in the 1980s, looked like we were an awful long way from the end because an awful lot of water had to go under the bridge. Today, I don't think not so much water needs to go under the bridge because our world is changing at a rapid rate of knots and we've got to be careful that we are not like a fro frog in hot water. You know what I'm saying? Now, our world changed a lot in the last two weeks. 
fairly innocuous thing, I know, but it illustrates that the hostility towards Christianity is growing at a rapid rate of knots. We are living closer to, under the tyranny of tolerance. Don't you dare let anyone tell you that we are living in a tolerant world. That is the biggest load of garbage I've ever heard. There is a systematic, a systematic effort to isolate and jettison Christianity out of Western world. And that is gathering a pace. When you have someone who receives a job as a CEO of an AFL of, of Essendon, Andrew Thornburn, who was in there for 30 hours in that job, 850k job. The president called him in his office and said, oh, there was a posting by your church 10 years ago on the subject of the LGBT alphabet. Because of that, he didn't even preach it, by the way, he was found guilty of association and was asked to resign. Why? Why is that? Why is that? The tyranny of tolerance is alive and well. And was there any outcry about religious intolerance? Not on your sweet Nelly. Oh, there's a few little ripples. But everybody just carries on. This man was found guilty by guilt by association of something that happens 10 years ago and the cancel culture shows no mercy under the guise of justice. There is no justice in cancel culture. There is no love in that uh, un, un, under that banner, that is intolerance. And that's the world in which we are living in now. That would never have happened in the 80s because they didn't worry about that sort of thing back then. Live and let live it was. And so that has dramatically, I think, our world is changing quite rapidly and with the rewriting at will of history. There seems to be a huge amount of desire to rewrite history and for media to push a narrative. Don't you think, the media is not unbiased. It is there to push a narrative. And if it doesn't fit the narrative, you are cancelled by the media and the media will hound you mercilessly as they have done with certain uh, political figures. And do you think that big tech is not pushing a narrative? Absolutely. And they are pushing a certain narrative that if you say certain things, your posts your video or whatever will be taken down. They are the new censorships. There are now in our world, there are, is it carbon, carbon officers that have been appointed in Melbourne to make sure that you, people are obeying and fulfilling climate change. <laughs> Dubai has carbon police officers. There is now talk about to make sure that your carbon footprint doesn't exceed a certain size. And the people who decide that fly around on private tin budgies. I don't get that. You know, you get Prince Harry who, who preaches evangelistically on these things. Really bugs me, along with the other elites. Now, why am I mentioning this? Because Christianity has been jettisoned from our world, a new religion is coming our way. And a new religion is one of that of climate change. 
and you are having people who are dictating on how we should live. And there was an interesting article um, in the Adventist Review, I think a couple of weeks ago. Jason put me onto this, so I'll blame Jason. Where is he? Is he here? Oh, <laughs> oh sorry, Jason. But it was an interesting article. Anyway, it says, a crucial statement found in June 28, 1904, says that the South and the Southern Watchmen identifies disasters, disruptions in the natural world as the trigger for societal and legislative demand for preserving the sacredness of Sunday. I find that interesting. Oh, let me read that again. Uh, and this is back in 1904. The Southern Watchman identifies disasters and disruptions in the natural world as the trigger for societal and legislative demand for preserving the sacredness of Sunday. Men in responsible positions will not only ignore and despise the Sabbath themselves, but from the sacred desk will urge upon the people the observance of the first day of the week. Pleading traditions, custom on behalf of man, made institutions. They will point to the calamities on the land and sea, to the storms of the wind, the floods and the earthquakes, and the destruction by fire as judgments indicating God's displeasure because Sunday is not sacredly observed. Now that last part may not be here yet, but here's, my, here's what I find interesting, that um, disasters and disruptions in the natural world will be the trigger for a change in legislation. Do you find that interesting? Now, poor old Andrew Thorburn, if he read that, would he sort of, you know, in the, in the kind of world that we live in, in the tyranny of climate change and, and cancel culture, don't think people would find that hard to believe. Now, what's also interesting is that, and, and uh, I better wind up, that there's a conference going on, and it's called Returning to Mount Sinai, a prophetic call for climate justice and a ceremony of repentance for Sunday, November 13, uh, 2022, in Mount Sinai, calling for the repentance of um, destroying the, the, the planet. Now, let, let me say this, I, I'm not for destroying the planet, I love trees, I'm not for you know, wholesale destruction of the planet at, at all. And as Adventists we need to preserve it. But what I am saying is that under the guise of climate change and the changing values in our world, it is making it increasingly difficult for Christians and Adventists to preach their message. Andrew Thorburn was dismissed after 30 hours for this and the media vilified him. Yet there was nothing said about an AFL woman player who refused to wear the pride jersey. Nothing was said here. Nothing to see here. Why is that? Because she was from a different religion. And that different religion was, well, you don't, just don't say anything about that. But over here, when it comes to Christianity, there just seems to be this real hostility toward it. And so when, when this was written over a hundred years ago, to say that disasters and calamities and that will be used to bring about legislation, I find interesting. But what I also will say, in this day and age in which we live, I don't find that difficult to believe that that will happen. Are you with me? All right. Now... What it says here, toward the end of the chapter, remember what the title of the sermon was? Is Jesus serious about defeating Babylon? 
What does it say at the end of the chapter? Uh, let's just have a, a wee look, reading from verse 17. Reading from verse 17, Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a, a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire, and called with a loud voice to the one who had a sharp sickle. Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung the sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest, and the earth threw it to the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden in the city, and the blood flowed from the winepress as high as the horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. Now, it says just a little bit back further that God's wrath will be poured without mixture. And it talks about the wine press and that this will be poured without mixture. So what does that, what does without mixture mean? Well, when they trod on the grape juice with their bare feet, and no doubt with their daily activities, their bare feet gave it a nice flavour. And, um, and so the, the grape juice was very rich. But what they would do is because grape juice would ferment, they would water it down. And so when God says that the, the wine will be poured out without mixture, this is not going to be watered down, folks. This is not going to be watered down. And then it outlines here at the end of the chapter when judgment comes out from the temple and uh, the sharp sickle will go through, judgment is, is executed. And then it talks about 1600 Stadia. What does that mean? Yours might say cubits. And it's just talking about, we'd be talking about a square. You remember in Revelation when it talks about God holding back the four, four what? Four winds. Holding back the four winds. What do we say four represents in Revelation? Revelation has... Uh, a lot about numbers, and numbers uh, have a qualitative aspect about them. And so the number four would mean universal. Holding back the four winds. All right, four winds of strife, universal strife coming upon the earth. All right, so you've got the number four, and then you've got the number, or well, you've got zero, zero, and you've got uh, four by four, which is 16. And then you've got the thousands, and so you've got 10 by 10 by 10. And we say that number 10 in, in biblical literature means complete. What John the Revelator is saying here is that the judgment of God that is going to be coming upon will be universal and universal, and it will be complete, complete, complete. Four times four times 10 times 10 times 10. The judgment will be universal. And the defeat of Babylon will be complete, complete, complete. He gives us that assurance. Our world is changing at a rapid rate of knots. Babylon, false religion, is all around us. And we need to have a laser-like focus, like Storm and Norman, on our relationship with God to block out those competing voices that so easily erode, disrupt, destroy our relationship with God and divert. We need to be very careful of that. Let us walk in these times with that laser-like focus on God and to do His will and not cut it down to our size. Keep our eyes focused on Him and Him only.